Tigers of the 1980s. From the first victory of 1981 to the unforgettable triumph over Alabama at Auburn in 1989, each chapter is filled with drama, action, and heart-stopping emotion. It's the story of a team that went from doormat to dominator. Some would call it a dream come true, but its success was not without sacrifice. The Tigers clawed their way to the top and truly deserve the distinction of being honored as the team of the decade in the SEC. We're looking forward to this challenge with the great anticipation, a lot of enthusiasm. As a sea of orange and blue, celebrants are tearing down the goalposts in this monumental victory, ladies and gentlemen, as the Auburn Tigers have defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide by the score of 23 to 22. He's going to break the tackle. He's going to break another tackle. 35, 40. Down the sideline. We've got a foot race at the 40, the 30, the 20. Bye, bye, move. Going to pitch to Jesse, and he's going to give it to Tillman on the end around. The 10, the 5. Tillman, he's in! Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! You are the champion of the best football conference in America. <laughs> The decade of the 80s did not dawn with tremendous promise. The Tigers failed to win a single game against an SEC opponent in 1980. But their fate dramatically changed when a new head football coach was hired in January of 1981. His name was Patrick Fain Dye. It is what I consider one of the top jobs in the in the south it is a school that has tremendous football tradition and it is a, is a school that i remember playing against and watching my older brothers play against back in the 50s and having coached against the university of auburn at, at times when they were certainly a feared football power in the south and i'm confident that uh, with the support of the Auburn people, the alumni, the former players, the student body, the faculty, the administration, that we will be able to bring this great football tradition back to what it once was. And we're looking forward to this challenge with the great anticipation, a lot of enthusiasm, and realizing fully that it is uh, it's going to take a lot of hard work and uh, probably a lot of patience on your part and our part, but uh, we will get the job done in the end. From the outset, Coach Dye's confidence and commitment were obvious. He came across a little different probably than we expected because he, he went back and told us how they had won when he was playing, they had won when he was coaching, and we were going to win here. And it was just like a matter of fact. Coach Dye immediately began the painstaking process of identifying the solid citizens that would form the foundation of the program. The grueling winter and spring workouts of 1981 have become legendary, but they had a purpose. Well, it started in the winter, and he'd work us, he'd just dog work us. We had, uh, it was short enough, we had nine weeks instead of the usual 11 for winter workout. And he basically ran just about everybody off. It was a uh, survival of the fittest. Matter of fact, I always wanted to get a t-shirt that said, I survived winter and spring with Coach Dye. Our practice here before had been real organized and everything, but it wasn't a real physical type practice. Um, they came in and, and really 
got after us. I mean, there were people, you know, bodies flying here and there. And of course, everybody knows about the coaches jumping on fumbles and things like that. And it was like, it was almost like they were, the coaches were at the point saying, if y'all, you know, if y'all don't pick it up, we'll go put the pads on and we'll come out here ourselves and whip your butt. But we, uh, we all learned how to work and we learned something about being accountable and uh, being responsible. And I guess that was, that was the start of learning how to win. The inaugural victory of the Pat Dye era came in his very first game as head coach in the season opener against TCU. Led by freshman running back Ron O'Neill, the Tigers triumphed 21 to 10. Auburn fans witnessed several other milestones in 1981. The Tigers played their first ever night game at Jordan-Hare Stadium. And Coach Dyer recorded the first two SEC victories of his career over LSU and Florida. But it was in a bitter 10-7 defeat at Tennessee that this team learned the most important lesson of the year. A valiant effort by Auburn's defense held the Volunteers scoreless throughout the second half. But in the game's waning moments, the Tigers drove to the Tennessee one-yard line, falling just short of victory. There's going to be a lot of days when you lay your guts on the line and you come away empty-handed. Ain't a damn thing you can do about it but go back and lay them on the line again. And again and again. Every coach, manager, Glad to be associated with you. You'll keep fighting like you did today. You'll keep playing like that. We can build a foundation that we can live a long, long time on and on. The Tigers hopes for a miraculous winning season collided with a legend in Birmingham. On that day, Alabama coach Bear Bryant was attempting to become the winningest coach in college football history. I never looked forward to playing against Coach Bryant. Uh, the fact that he was going after his 315th win had very little significance as far as I was concerned. It was just a, another Auburn-Alabama football game. Uh, he was going to win that 315th game, whether it be against Alton or whoever. I think we established in that ball game, though, even though we didn't win and we didn't play well in the late stages of the fourth quarter, I think we did establish the fact in that game that, you know, that uh, we were not going to fear Alabama. And, uh, of course, Coach Bryant knew that because he knew me and he knew our staff. Despite an inspired effort by the Tigers, this day belonged to Bear Bryant. The Crimson Tide prevailed 28 to 17, but as destiny would have it, this was to be the Bears' final victory over Auburn. He's the greatest coach in the game's ever known. I don't think there's any question about it. And if anybody's gonna have that, record it's certainly he's the one that deserves it i see i'm proud for you proud of anything i'm proud of you you know hell of a job this year real yeah. great job thank that. you real deal thank you although the year ended on a losing note everyone sensed something special about this team and its future i can't say that uh the first team that we coached at all may be my favorite team the 81 team that had a losing season but uh, they were anything but losers as far as I was concerned, uh, particularly individually, and the fact that, you know, they stayed with us. And they believed in what we were trying to, to accomplish and believed in what we, wanted to, what we were trying to teach. And the, the ones that weren't seniors that stayed uh, became champions. All, I think all of the guys that were on that team really appreciate being associated with, with some of the great teams, even though we were just the foundation. He probably liked it because he probably had to work the hardest with us than he did with any other team. We were, uh, we didn't have a squad, you know, we were just out there kind of waiting for something to happen and he was the catalyst. In 1982, more pieces were added to the championship puzzle. 
junior Randy Campbell emerged as the perfect trigger man for Auburn's wishbone. Transfer Doug Smith, who once played for Coach Dye at East Carolina, solidified the defensive front. And freshman recruits like Tommy Agee, Steve Wallace, Jeff Parks, Gerald Robinson, Tom Powell, Ron Middleton, and Gerald Williams would make an impact for years to come. But the player who made the biggest impact in the fall of 1982 was a freshman from Bessemer named Vincent Bo Jackson. Bo was a talent that gave us a chance to beat anybody we played. And uh, he, was, he was a player that people feared because of his physical talent and appearance and the kind of player he was. From the very outset of the 82 season, improvements over the previous year were obvious. With Bo now in the backfield with Lionel James, the wishbone was suddenly a real weapon. The defense had matured tremendously in just one year. Despite the loss of Donnie Humphrey in the third game of the year, it had the look of a championship unit. Against Georgia Tech, it presented Coach Dye with the first shutout of his tenure. The Tennessee Volunteers had knocked the Tigers to the ground time and time again. But in 1982, times were changing. In front of a sold-out crowd at Jordan-Hare Stadium, the Tigers rose up and put Auburn back on the map in the Southeastern Conference. Final score, Auburn 24, Tennessee 14. When Georgia came calling, the Bulldogs were undefeated and ranked number one in the nation. Although they would leave with a win, they also left bruised and exhausted having been pushed to the limit by a young team that would one day replace the Dogs as the dominant team in the SEC. Although the loss was bitter for the Tigers, they learned a lot about themselves that day. And I really didn't have a talk plan for getting beat. When they were experiencing the hurt that they were going through, they needed something positive to come out of that Georgia game. And during my struggling, you know, and trying to come up with the right words, and we were in the dressing room, and it was quiet as, I mean, you know, nobody was saying a word, and there was tears in kids' eyes and probably mine and everybody else's. And, uh, but it was just dead silence, and you could hear the roar of the Auburn fans in the stadium and uh, I mean it was almost like we just won the game and it was just a, a constant chant for 10 or 15 minutes of high you know we'd been in the locker room I guess four or five minutes and and all you could hear was the fans is great to be an Auburn Tiger and uh, and we had just lost this close ball game to Georgia and and uh, and it was to our fans to to have seen those kids go out against uh, tremendous odds and play with everything they had in their body and mind and soul, uh, you know, they, the fans appreciated it. And of course it gave me an opportunity to, at that moment, to express to them that that's what our program was all about. And uh, it also gave me the opportunity to tell them that we would be in uh, a lot of games in the future the same way. And if they played the same way they did that day, then we were going to win our share of them. Little did I know that we would have that opportunity two weeks from that day in, in Birmingham. There was a sense of anticipation that this would be the year that the Tigers would end Alabama's 10-year domination of Auburn. 
the drama on the field was indescribable. But few people knew about the drama off the field that nearly changed the course of history. As a matter of fact, that was the week that I uh, decided that I was, that I, that I wanted to just go home and not play any more sports, just go home. I had a lot of personal problems and um, I just didn't know how to handle it at that time, except but to turn my back on it and run. I, I had a talk with the coaches and I also talked with Coach Dye and he told me exactly what you said, that I gave the Auburn fans hope and uh, they were looking forward to the confrontation with Alabama that year. And um, we went out and, and we played hard for 60 minutes. And uh, when the dust cleared, we were leaving. We won. And I, I uh, think that game turned my life around. I think I m uh, toured more in uh, that game than I did the, for the next three years. The newfound maturity of this team proved paramount to victory. Like the Georgia game two weeks earlier, the Tigers faced a do-or-die drive late in the fourth quarter. This time, they would not be denied. It was the end of an era. It was the beginning of an era. It was another step toward the Tigers' ultimate goal. And down the goal post in this monumental victory, ladies and gentlemen, as the Auburn Tigers have defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide by the score of 23 to 22. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you, the ones that want to, I'm going to go back out there and thank our people. That, that's, the, that's the game that sticks out the most in my whole five years at Auburn. You know, we played in the Sugar Bowl, the Tangerine Bowl. We beat Alabama again in 83, but none of those games uh, mean quite as much as that 82 game because we hadn't beaten them in 10 years and they were favored to win. Uh, that, was, that has to be the turning point in uh, Coach Dye's era at Auburn or in Auburn football in the 80s was the win over Alabama in 82. It's, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and a lot of my good friends. A trip to the Tangerine Bowl, Auburn's first bowl appearance since 1974, was the Tigers' reward for their remarkable 8-3 season. Ironically, in a game featuring two eventual Heisman Trophy winners, Bo Jackson and Boston College's Doug Flutie, Randy Campbell won MVP honors as the Tigers defeated BC 33-26. Auburn was buzzing with championship fever throughout the offseason of 1983. But tragedy struck when starting fullback Greg Pratt collapsed and died following a series of running drills prior to the start of fall practice. Suddenly, thoughts of championships and bowl games seemed unimportant. There's no question that's a tragedy to his family and our prayers and sympathy, sympathy certainly go to them. Somehow, life went on. And through the hitting and hard work of practice, the Auburn family, players and coaches, dealt with their grief and focused on the season ahead. They never left Greg Pratt out of their thoughts and prayers. Perhaps because of his death, this team achieved a kind of closeness that few teams rarely experience. It did bring our team closer together because we had a purpose now. We had something more than just, than just Auburn and ourselves and our families and our coaches to play for. We talked about it almost every week. We never forgot about it. And we, you know, we felt like we dedicated that season to Greg Pratt. And 
I'm sure that in his way, he, you know, helped us win the Southeastern Conference Championship. 1983 was indeed destined to be a championship season. And had it not been for an unexpected letdown against Texas, it would have been a national championship year. The hard lessons learned the previous two years were paying dividends. You know, the 83 team was, uh, was built by the 82 team and the 81 team. And, you know, the, the Edmund Nelsons, the, the Bob Harris's, the Mark Dormanys, the, uh, the Keith Euchers, uh, Danny Skutax, you know, it was, all, it was all, you know, a part of, of that. And we just built on what they left. For the first time in the Pat Dye era, an Auburn team was expected to win. Not only did they win, but they did so in dramatic fashion. The Tigers trounced Tennessee 37 to 14 in Knoxville. Against Maryland, a 119-yard rushing performance by Tommy Agee helped overcome a 17 to 14 deficit and defeat Boomer Esiason and the Terps 35 to 23. The Tigers stunned Florida with a 55-yard touchdown explosion by Bo Jackson in the first quarter. But it took a courageous goal line stand to win yet another barn burner, 28 to 21. Perhaps the most dramatic victory of the year came at the expense of Florida State. Both teams played inspired football. The Seminoles took a three-point lead late in the fourth quarter, forcing Auburn to go the length of the field against FSU's defense and the clock. The Tigers faced fourth downs time and time again, but prevailed and took the lead when Lionel James somehow found the left corner of the end zone. FSU still had one last opportunity until it was snuffed out by All-America Greg Carr's interception. It was over and Auburn fans were breathing again. The 27 to 24 victory was typical of a year filled with magic moments. Game by game, the realization grew that this team could reach the summit and claim the SEC title for Auburn people everywhere. They say that defense wins championships. On November 12, 1983, Auburn's defense did just that. In still another nail biter, the Tigers wrestle the SEC crown away from the three time defending champion Georgia Bulldogs. The 13-7 victory propelled Auburn to the Sugar Bowl for the first time since 1971. Auburn already owned a share of the SEC title, but a loss to Alabama would force Auburn to share its first title in 26 years with its arch rival. On this day, Bo Jackson would almost single-handedly beat Alabama. 
His 71-yard touchdown burst in the third quarter put Auburn up for good. The 23-20 victory made it two in a row over the Crimson Tide and gave the Tigers a chance to win the national championship on New Year's Day. The trip to New Orleans seemed like a dream come true. In just three years, the Tigers had become one of the finest football teams in the country. It was time to celebrate. Although Miami's dramatic victory over Nebraska prevented the Tigers from winning the national title they deserved, Auburn displayed its championship character to the nation by staging one more fourth quarter comeback. With 27 seconds left, Al Del Greco prepared to kick the winning field goal. The Tigers won 9-7 and were Sugar Bowl champions for 1984. They had come a long way since that tragic day in August. This was a game and a season never to be forgotten. You're going to be in a lot of tough battles next year, year after year after year, individual battles with yourself. You won't have teammates with you. But if you'll just look back and think about that January the 2nd <laughs> night in New Orleans, gain a little strength from it, it'll help you down the road. On behalf of the Sugar Bowl, oh, yeah. I'm only the president. We're presenting you all with the trophy champion of the Sugar Bowl, 1984. <laughs> In 1982, a bright star was rising in the southern sky. It burst on the college football scene like a supernova. He was number 34 from Bessemer, Alabama. His name was Bo Jackson. The first thing I can remember about Bo, I guess it was the first day we practiced, they put him at fullback in the wishbone. And I won't ever forget this. And I, I was, I hadn't played much, but I'd been here, this was my fourth year. I'd been around a little. And uh, we were running just our basic triple option play and I put the ball out and it poked, it poked him in the side. You know, of course he didn't say anything. He was real quiet, real shy. And I told Coach Casey, who was a running back coach, I said, Coach, you need to back him up a little bit. He's too close. So he said, okay. So he, he got him backed up, you know, where he was supposed to be. You know, because I've been here four years, Bo's first day freshman. I figured he lined up wrong. So we ran the same play again, and I stuck it right in the side again. And I said, Coach Casey, I said, you got to, he said, you got to, you got to pick it up. So this guy's a hoss, <laughs> you know. And uh, he was. He was just extremely fast and strong. And everything he did on the practice field was amazing. Although Bo was not highly recruited, most observers did not expect him to choose Auburn. I, did, I really didn't decide to go to Auburn until I, it was like one or two weeks before signing day. And I had had a talk with, with some coaches from Tuscaloosa. And I've been a staunch Alabama fan all of my life. And uh, I still am to a certain extent. But... Um, they made it perfectly clear that I probably wouldn't get a chance to play until the end of my sophomore or the beginning of my junior season because of the talent that they already had there. I looked at the situation at Auburn where they just hired this new coach, um, Coach Dye, and I can remember one night sitting up watching the news where he did a press conference and he said that um, um, don't expect uh, the big things to happen um, right off the bat because we are going to build and we are going to keep building and keep building until we're back. A few weeks later, Coach Dye visited with Bo and Bo made his decision. 
I come home from from a baseball game and I was in my laundry room doing my baseball uniform. And he and another coach was upstairs in in um, in in uh, the dining room with my mother. They were drinking coffee, and he came down the stairs and he just flat out said, "Bo, are you planning on coming 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 to Auburn?" This was after I had the confrontation with the Tuscaloosa coaches. I said yes, and that's all was said. And he turned around and he went back up the stairs, and I went on with doing what I was doing. Bo possessed a rare combination of speed, power, and raw determination. He is the only running back in Auburn history to gain more than 4,000 yards. He overcame injuries and adversity to become the most honored player in college football in 1985. So on behalf of the members of our club, it's my privilege to announce this year's winner of the Heisman Memorial Trophy. In the closest vote in the history of this trophy, the winner is from Auburn University, Bo Jackson. There has never been, and may never be, another Bo Jackson. His unique God-given ability and soft-spoken manner have endeared him to people everywhere and made him Auburn's goodwill ambassador to the nation. Third down six to the Auburn 24. Pat's going to leave it with ball. And he's going to break a tackle. He's going to break another tackle. 35-40. Down the sidelines. We've got a foot race at the 40, the 30, the 20. Bye-bye, Bo! In 1984 and 85, even with the contributions of Bo Jackson, the Tigers fell short of the lofty heights achieved by the 1983 SEC champions. Although they were still winning and made two more bowl appearances, there were also major disappointments. Devastating losses in the kickoff classic at Tennessee and in Birmingham. Changes were in the wind. In the locker room following the 1986 Cotton Bowl, Coach Dye made a new commitment to the team. That you young ones coming back, my plan for you, and I've thought a great deal about it, is we're going to start in January, and we're going to we're going to build we're going to build us a football team. Most of the guys uh, reflected on the year and how they did, and realized what it was going to take to to push on and, and you know to become a, a better team and a closer team. And I think that's probably uh, what Coach Dye tried to relate to us is that you know. Although we didn't reach the goals that we set, uh, we can still do that the next year. So I'm going to ask all of you to, to help us and, and believe in us, have faith in us, just like those guys that came four years ago. But we're going we're gonna to put the program back up there where it's, where it's been. Like a breath of fresh air, 1986 dawned with a new purpose and bright promise. There were new faces on the coaching staff, a more aggressive philosophy on defense, and a new commitment to team unity. The most dramatic change was on offense. Gone was Auburn's trademark wishbone attack. In its place was a pro-style passing offense and an unknown quarterback named Jeff Berger. Berger responded with a poise of a veteran, throwing for 200 yards plus in each of his first two games as the starter. The first real test of the year came against Tennessee. After embarrassing the Tigers the previous year, 
the volunteers were unprepared for the Auburn onslaught of 86. This was a hungry football team, creating its own identity and enjoying every minute of it. Brent Fullwood emerged from the shadow of Bo Jackson to put up some impressive numbers of his own. As the shadows lengthened at Jordan-Hare Stadium, Auburn led 34 to eight, sending a message to the conference that the Tigers were alive and well. The foundation was being rebuilt stronger and better than ever. In a few short years, it would support an unprecedented string of championships. Heartbreaking losses to Florida and Georgia ended the Tigers' title hopes for 1986. With one game remaining, this team faced a critical test of character. To defeat Alabama in Birmingham would require every man to lay it on the line, every play, for 60 minutes. This one would be yet another classic, with Auburn providing the pride and determination in the fourth quarter. A Brent Fullwood touchdown pulled the Tigers within striking distance. Berger is under a big rush. He's going to shoot a pass that is caught. Great catch down at the Alabama 41st down Auburn. With 43 seconds left, Auburn crossed up the Alabama defense. Berger out of the eye. He's going to pitch to Jesse, and he's going to give it to Tillman on the end around. The 10, the 5. Tillman, he's in. Touchdown, Auburn. Touchdown, Auburn. Are you Tillman? 32 seconds left. Auburn is going to hit 20 to 17. After two years of adversity and misfortune at Legion Field, the Tigers had overcome their greatest rival and took one more step back to the top of the SEC. A month later, Auburn celebrated New Year's Day at the Citrus Bowl in a game against Southern Cal. The Tigers played a tough physical game, giving their Pac-10 opponent a lesson in SEC Southern style football. Its efforts typify the 1986 season. Playing with heart and character it was rewarded with a satisfying 16-7 victory, the 500th in Auburn football history. Right eye combo, cut back on one. Ready? The 1987 squad continued to build on the accomplishments of the previous year. They recognized their potential and intensify their efforts to bring a championship to the Plains. The thing that was uh, was great about the 87 season is defensively we had everybody coming back. Uh, there wasn't any real strange faces in the huddle that we played with in 86 and everybody just kind of knew each other's moves and, uh, and knew what was expected out of each other. Uh, I think going into the 87 season we probably worked harder than the year before because we were opening up with Texas and I don't think Auburn had beat Texas in a couple of the last meetings, whatever, and there was a lot, always a lot more pressure on you when you're going into a big game because you don't know what to expect. Uh, and we were really high that game to play. We, we wanted to win so bad and win big. And I guess, you know, the emotions come out strange sometimes. You know, I hugged the referee that game. And uh, it was, you know, you just, you just get caught up in it so much. Uh. The largest crowd in the history of Jordan-Hare Stadium and a national television audience heightened the anticipation even more. Unfortunately for the unsuspecting Longhorns, Auburn was more than ready to play. 
led by a suffocating defense, the Tigers roll to a 31-3 route, avenging the only loss of the 1983 championship team. With the leadership of All-America defensive tackle Tracy Rocker and SEC Player of the Year quarterback Jeff Berger, this team had the stability and confidence to go the distance. Berger was throwing to the likes of All-SEC tight end Walter Reeves, dependable Duke Donaldson, and the All-SEC game-breaker Lawyer Tillman. This team now had the potential to score quickly and from anywhere on the field. For every great team, there are magic moments that define its character. At Georgia Tech, this team had such a day. After a 91-yard desperation drive, Jeff Berger found Lawyer Tillman in the end zone to put Auburn up by four with 24 seconds left. But the most stunning play was yet to come. Andre Bruce took a deflected Georgia Tech pass and raced 48 yards for another score. For Bruce, it was the ultimate ending for one of the finest individual performances in Auburn history. He recorded three interceptions, three sacks, and caused a fumble to set up Auburn's first touchdown. Following Georgia Tech, the Tigers faced Amen Corner. Florida, Georgia, and Alabama were all that stood between them and the Sugar Bowl. Auburn had not beaten all three in the same year since 1983. This year, they would meet the challenge head on. They maul the Gators in front of a record Jordan-Hare Stadium crowd, 29 to seven. Next in Athens, a 17-point third quarter blitz took away the Bulldogs' bite. Auburn was just one game away from a trip to New Orleans and the Sugar Bowl. This team had come too far to let the Crimson Tide stand in their way. The Tigers' defense simply refused to yield. Both offenses faced tremendous pressure, but Auburn broke through late in the second quarter, putting together a 98-yard drive. Harry Mose gave the Tigers all the lead they would need. When Lyle added an insurance field goal in the fourth quarter, The two-year quest for excellence had culminated with this 10 to nothing victory. The Auburn Tigers were once again champions. The Auburn Tigers have shut out the Alabama Crimson Tide by the score of 10 to nothing here at Legion Field in Birmingham. The clock running down, seven, six, five, four, three, Two, one, it is over, ladies and gentlemen. Hail to the champions of the Southeastern Conference. The Auburn Tigers have defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide. Ten to nothing here at Legion Field. War Eagle. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for you to win it outright. And, and well, we only got one champion in the, in the conference. You are the champion of the best football conference in America. In 1987, 
the Tigers emerged as the champions of the SEC. In 1988, they stood at the top of the mountain, the prime target of every other team in the conference. Auburn's defense was ready for the challenge. Led by an all-SEC front line of Benji Rowland, Tracy Rocker, and Ron Stallworth, it would lead the nation in nearly every category of team defense. It may well have been the finest in a long history of great Auburn defenses, and that's saying something. Intimidating defense has been a constant of the Pat Dye era. From the time of Edmund Nelson, Bob Harris, and Greg Carr, to Kurt Crane, to Kevin Porter, and Quentin Riggins, defense has provided the backbone of the program. For four of those years, Tracy Rocker gave his heart and soul to this defense. He exploded on the scene as a freshman and made opposing quarterbacks miserable for four years. In 1988, he was honored as the outstanding lineman in the nation, winning both the Outland and Lombardi Awards. A lot of people have helped, you know, and played a role in, in, in achieving these awards. And, you know, and you sit there and it's all individual, but really it's not. And because I, I know I played as a team football player. Against Tennessee, Tracy triggered a defensive assault that turned a close contest into a rout. Final score, Auburn 38, Tennessee 6. One set back, that's Joseph Reggie, a short drop, and he's going to throw long this time in the end zone, over the shoulder, pitch, touchdown, Auburn! When the season began, Reggie Slack stepped into the huddle and instantly emerged as an all-SEC performer. He led the conference in passing efficiency and possessed the instincts of a natural leader. With Reggie at the controls, the Auburn offense enjoyed one of its most productive seasons of the decade. In the face of weekly challenges to their crown, the Tigers were undaunted. They played with a single-minded purpose, to repeat as champions of the SEC. To do so, they would have to break the jinx of Florida Field, where they had not won since 1972. This year, they not only won, but shut out the Gators 16 to nothing. It's been 16 years, man, since we won right here. And you did it in style, you did it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> The Tigers saved their finest performance of the year for the annual showdown with Georgia. They knew what was at stake and realized the best way to defend their SEC title was to mount an all-out offensive assault. The Tigers threw everything they had at the Bulldogs and it took its toll. In the fourth quarter, they own the line of scrimmage. A touchdown pass to All-America Walter Reeves sealed the 20-10 victory. Auburn was just one win away from a return trip to New Orleans. It was fitting that the 1988 Iron Bowl clash with Alabama was dominated by Auburn's defense. 
All SEC defensive tackle Ron Stallworth was a one-man wrecking crew. His 13 tackles and four sacks earned him SEC Player of the Week honors. Late in the third quarter, the Tigers began a march that would lead them to the promised land. Auburn's leading rusher, Stacy Danley, brought them close. Vincent Harris scored the touchdown that ensured a second straight SEC title. In 1989, the 50th anniversary of Jordan-Hare Stadium, the experts predicted smooth sailing for Auburn in the SEC race. But the experts were wrong. Although the Tigers avenged their 1988 loss to LSU, they suffered a demoralizing setback at Tennessee. For much of the year, they seemed to struggle to find an identity. For the first 59 minutes against the Florida Gators, it was much the same story. Behind by four points, facing a fourth and 11 with 26 seconds left in the ball game, it appeared as if Auburn's quest for a third straight SEC title would end in failure. They trail seven to three. Slack's got one set back and four wide receivers. Desperation play. Slack's going to throw in the end zone. Got to be right open to Larson. He's got it. Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! In one dramatic moment, the Tigers seized victory from the jaws of defeat and turned the season completely around. It would be hard to imagine that anything could match this magic moment. But three weeks later, these same fans and the entire nation would witness an historic first in football history. December 2nd, 1989. It was Alabama at Auburn. The first time ever. Reggie Slack needing five yards on third down. It's going to throw along to Alexander Wright. Oh, great catch over the shoulder in. By the 10, down to the 7-yard line. This was a day Auburn people had dreamed about for years. It was an event of incredible proportions. Full house backfield, two tight ends. Give up the middle, over and in. It goes up as he dives in. Touchdown, Auburn! The players on the field sensed the magnitude of the moment and simply played magnificent football. This final chapter of the decade of the 80s played out like a dream come true. Auburn Tigers had won their fourth straight over Alabama, 30 to 20, and claimed the SEC title for the third consecutive season. They were truly the team of the decade in the Southeastern Conference. Tonight's what our program's all about. I want you to I want you to think about it and let it sink in deep. This is the reason we work in the summertime in January and February and the spring. This is the reason we push you beyond what you think you can do to experience moments like this. Ain't no easy way in life, and it wasn't easy out there tonight, but you were prepared for the task at hand. Every one of you players, I mean, ain't no way, ain't no way, I ain't, I ain't smart enough to tell you how I feel about you. 
I mean, and, and because, I mean, this family, every one of you, I mean, you know it. Sure, I'd like to be 12, 11 and old and, you know, not, but I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't swap this year for any year that I've been at Auburn. I wouldn't swap it, men, because I've watched you struggle and I've watched you wrestle with them angels, and, 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 but I've watched you grow up and become men. I watched you become me. <laughs> Since Pat Dye became head coach in 1981, no SEC school has won more championships or more games than Auburn. To Auburn people, however, what they will remember most is the dedication, commitment, and love that hundreds of young men and their coaches have had for Auburn University. What they learned both on and off the field will be with them for the rest of their lives. Each one will forever be a champion. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there I'd like to thank for the part that they've played in my life and making it possible. Uh, you start with Sue and my children that made many sacrifices in order for me to, to spend the time that I spent at, uh, at my job by coaching staff and, and the endless hours that they've worked to, to build this program. Uh, the administration and board of trustees at Auburn have uh, been tremendous in their support of our program, our fans, the student body, the faculty, and uh, and the players themselves and their families and the sacrifices that they've made over the years. And it's been a, you know, it's, a, it's an old uh, cliche or whatever that, uh, but it is actually a family affair at Auburn, and I wouldn't have it any other way.